Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name's Edith uh, P., and I'm an alcoholic. Hey, boy, it's a pleasure to be here, and... uh, and Greg's been great to me, and uh, I should probably, I don't know what your tradition is, but I try to follow the tradition of the meetings, but uh, thanks to a very loving God who's got a lot of uh, patience and benevolence and a lot of church basements and a sponsor who's, I mean, doggone, just, uh, just gracious, uh I've been sober since the first day of June, 1987. For that, I'm very grateful. Um, But anyway, Greg said, well, how long did it take you to get here? And I was kind of hemming and hawing because I didn't want to tell him. But in February of uh, 2000, my husband uh, got me a present of race car driving school. So I was practicing driving down here. I got off the uh <laughs> I got off the internet all the different routes and the shortest one was four hours and forty five minutes from Omaha and I got here in four hours and ten minutes. <laughs> so I, I called my uh law clerk and I said, just put it on the computer that I beat the Expedia dot com <laughs> shortest route (laughs) but anyway uh greg's been real good trying to accommodate me and i wish that i had done what i usually do except i got his wife you know i usually on the way down here call and say oh i i thought i was speaking tomorrow you know and act like i'm gonna be here at 10 30 but i got her and i just couldn't do it to her her knowing me so little so i didn't get to i didn't get to uh, you know, kind of cause any trouble. I love to cause trouble, not the kind of trouble I used to cause. Um, and I brought a, a joke up here because I always have to read them. Oh, yeah, I love it. Do you ever read The Grapevine? Y'all probably have a grapevine representative. This is an old one. Yeah, this is March 2000. The definition of an alcoholic bottom is when things get worse faster than you can lower your standards. <laughs> yeah. Did a lot of standard lowering. <laughs> but uh anyway, I have a I wanted to say I'm sorry I missed Cindy because my husband and I had an appointment. I don't know if she's here tonight. I'm sure I'll get to meet her from Montana. <clears throat> um But I had a kind of one of those opportunities to, again, be aware of how fortunate I am when I was driving here and I was realizing how close I was to Albert Lee, Minnesota. And in 1983, my my parents gave me uh, some uh, second all, my parents did this, to sedate me. and put me on a plane, and they flew me into Albert Lee, Minnesota, where I was supposed to go to a treatment hospital, but they were full. But all I remember is I'd been in Nashville, like wearing cutoffs, you know, in Tennessee, and it was snowing in April. (laughs) And I thought, where am I? (laughs) When I finally came to, I thought, I must be, I don't know what this is, but... It wasn't something I was uh, uh, had planned to do, but anyway, I had a memory of Albert Lee, Minnesota, and so I I am very pleased that now you're welcoming me to Minnesota instead of me coming under those other conditions. Um, I got uh, uh, a history of growing up in the South, and but I didn't think you knew that. <laughs> anyway, I got uh, I grew up in Alabama. And uh, we uh, had a, happened to live in a county where there was uh, no allowances for drinking. So you could be arrested for violating the prohibition law. If you can believe that, I know it's true, I have been arrested for that. But uh, 
until 1980, I guess 89. I, I was from a dry county, Morgan County, and it's in the northern part of Alabama. So when I was young, my father would go to the liquor store, come home, stock a liquor cabinet, and he and my mother uh, would have some drinks. My mother was younger than my daddy, and she had grown up very poor, was uneducated. My daddy had more more of an education than she did. He was a descendant of Clarence Dara, and uh, he was believed in evolution and uh, was an Episcopalian. My mother was a fundamentalist, <clears throat> and so they had we had an interesting childhood. Uh, but I always appreciated it because I thought it helped me, at least in law, to look at both sides <laughs> of things. But uh, my daddy would drink quite a bit when I was younger, and then as time passed, my mother took up drinking, and uh, it eventually killed her. She died of drinking in 1994, and uh, I can tell you that I don't uh, look back on that um, with uh, much regret, except that I really didn't understand the paralysis that she was in. You know, I had by that time been offered the opportunity to get sober, and at the same time I was desperate. And man, when that occurs, that's a, just a, some grace it was for me. And those two things happened to me that never happened to her. And uh, her path, I don't believe, is any less spiritual than anyone else's. But she... Um, really was pretty fragile and I think was really suffering. So my my only hardship now that I look back and I've tried to make amends to her is that uh, I didn't have a little more kindness about the paralysis and the fear that she was in to stop drinking because it was her best friend like it was for me. I, drinking was great. I wanted to be in a coma. I loved that. It was something I didn't want to lose. Anyway, growing up, uh, uh, my folks taught us what was right and wrong, and they were, uh, you know, they would, did the best they could. They came to a point where they pretty much just shared a refrigerator, <laughs> but uh, they, they were, you know, they stayed together because at that point in time, I'm 41, and they divorced by when I was about 19. I had a younger brother who was probably more affected by that, but they remained as a partnership, if for the only purpose of raising their children. And uh, as time passed, I would, uh, you know get in front of judges and my daddy had to hire lawyers for me and we had an old boat on the Tennessee River. We, my daddy still lives about, he lives in the house he grew up in. He's 77. <laughs> my husband went there, we went there a few months ago and he said, hey, Shine, my daddy's name's Shine. Shine, you got any equity in this house? And Shine, yeah. Anyway, he's, it wasn't as funny as it was then, but uh, he... He he took us out on the river all the time. I grew up water skiing and swimming. My father was a scout and a raider in World War II, which is an underwater uh, military man. He detonated bombs underwater. <clears throat> he loved swimming. We always went swimming. We went out in the boat. And as I got to be 13 and 14 and 15, I'd take the boat out alone. Well, we had a, a older lady down the road at Triana, and she'd sell us a case of slits any time, day or night, six bucks. And uh, and that's the one advantage of going to the bootlegger because they're open all the time. <laughs> now, if they don't know you, they'd just as soon shoot your kneecaps off. But if they did know you, they'd let you come around and buy, you know, overpriced beer and whiskey. And I didn't get much from a still, but I, you know, I knew, uh, drank from time to time, bear cat which is stilled, and uh, one old guy that worked for my daddy used to always say, now, Edith, don't you get into that because it'll make you go blind. And I really had I kept that memory with me. He told me that when I was 9 or 10, and I, I tended to be wary of it, and I'd usually drink what was bottled. Um, so we'd go out on the river all the time, and finally this old boat of shines I had uh, you know, my brother was waiting one day on the shore. He was younger, so he he was standing behind me to go out uh, on the river. 
And I pulled up with all these ne'er-do-wells that I ran with. And uh, one of the guys who was driving handed my little brother the steering wheel. And then, <laughs> of course, it had come off. And I don't know how we'd gotten to the shore. But anyway, and then the whole front, uh, you know, there's a, a front casing part. And that had fallen off. And there's my poor little brother waiting to go out on the river. He'd been waiting there for two or three hours. And we were late. We all got off and left him aside and finally that boat sank to the bottom of the Tennessee River which I thought was fitting uh, for a conclusion. I was a terrible um, driver. I always drove when I was drinking and uh, I would make accommodations. Maybe you did that too. You know as your as your behavior's dropping like that grapevine uh, joke talks about, you you really have to keep drinking. Because you're so, uh, you know, unhappy with what you see when you wake up. So it becomes a necessity. It did for me. Uh, and I didn't really feel comfortable doing anything, uh, but drinking. So when I wasn't drinking, I was, I was, uh, like my skin was on backwards. I've heard some people say newcomers before. And that's how I felt. Um, so it was a comfort to me. I loved it. It was available in my home, although it was not something that my parents uh, condoned. Uh, but as time passed, I started having these car accidents, and I would get arrested. And, you know, it's always a hardship when you're dishonoring your folks and you live in a small town in Fairmont. If you're in front of the judge and your daddy's sitting by him at Sunday morning church and then you kind of, you know, it makes you slink down in your seat a bit because you know that it's you're kind of publicized. I was in the newspaper. A good friend of my parents owned the newspaper, the Decatur Daily. Well, they couldn't forego printing about me because it was in the public record. So there'd be news in the newspaper and I dishonored my parents over and over again. And, uh, you know, I've tried to make amends to my father and my mother while she was alive for that because it's, uh, now as a step parent, and I was telling Greg this, um, my stepson was gone the other night. We didn't know where he was. And it truly gave me, uh, that what you always say, you know, you, you wish it was as uh, easy as you thought it would, and that isn't what I'm trying to say. Uh, the job of parenting takes everything that I have and about 50% more. Um, and I am a parent to a child who has two other parents. And when he didn't come home, it gave to me the sense of a reminder of everything that my parents had lived through. My father married a woman when he was about 70, and she died of cancer four years ago. And my daddy drinks quite a bit. And he left one night, and I was sitting on my stepmother's porch down in South Alabama. And I called my brother, and I said, Shine hadn't come home. And it was 2.30 in the morning. And I said, doggone it, Dara, I'm getting worried. What do you think I should do? He said, why don't you just sit your ass there and suffer like Shine used to on the porch waiting for you to come home all those nights. (laughs) So anyway, you don't understand the hardship you cause other people until you're living it, maybe, is, is the message that I've been receiving lately. Um, as time passed, I keep using that phrase, but I keep thinking about it. it seemed like that time was passing very slowly when I was in jail, but it was passing very quickly when, when you're, uh, um, as you look back now. Um, but I did, you know, I don't know how many times I went to jail, but I was, uh, been in the Douglas County jail a few times. Um, and I went off to school, finally. I worked on a farm for a while. I'm sure there has to be some farmers here. That was the hardest damn work I ever did in my life. I went home begging my father, saying, please, about 17, I really quit coming home. And uh, I went home to my daddy and said, if you'll give me a chance at getting a college education, I'd sure love to try it. 
and he conceded. Um, and right about this time, when I was 17, my father had bought me a car, which he later realized was a tremendous mistake. But anyway, I uh, drinking and eating some Perkinan, and I, I had a train a car collision. And the woman who was with me was uh, badly injured. I, I was too. I, I cut my larynx, my throat, and uh, not long ago I saw the doc's son who had done this surgery on me, and he. Uh, said, you know, my father asked me about you that not too long ago. He told me that your throat injury was one of the worst he'd ever worked on. And I said, I hope you'll tell him I'm particularly glad he made it to the hospital late that night to, to work on me. Um, but we ended up, I was in intensive care for a long time. This other woman had a head injury. She's my old running buddy. I love her very much. She's never uh, found it necessary to come to Alcoholics Anonymous, but she still goes at it pretty hard, uh, and she's tough. Uh, she was in an argument over Christmas that my husband oversaw in a bar, and uh, Richard came around to tell me I was sitting with my daddy in another part of this establishment, and Richard said, Jane's in there, and this guy's kind of getting on her, and, and Richard said, but my money's on Jane. <laughs> so, but she's, she's uh, I, you know, I just hope that when I'm there, I can be an example of what Alcoholics Anonymous has to offer, because we may be the only example of the big book that somebody ever sees. So remember that. Remember that when you're in your meeting, the story of Chuck Chamberlain, when the he sees the guy out in the audience and Chamberlain's talking in, in the book A New Pair of Glasses. And Chamberlain says, well, I, I saw that guy out there and he was having a bad time of it. It must have been his first meeting. A year later, I see him and he's picking up a, a year cake. And so I went to the guy and I said, hey, man, how, how'd you do it? And Chamberlain said, I'm thinking that he might say something favorable about me and what I'd said at that first meeting. And the guy says, I was shaking so bad at that first meeting. And the lady sitting by me lit my cigarette for me. He said, so I came back the next night. <laughs> what kind of kindness are we giving to the person who's sitting by us uh, or at our office or whatever place we're called on to be an example? Because it has to permeate our life, doesn't it? past the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. My husband is not an alcoholic. He likes a lot of horse racing, but uh, he he's uh, he's often saying, "What isn't this supposed to work at our home?" Because he heard Bob Bazant say that one time. So now he's uh, he's kind of gnawing at me. Um, but anyway, I, I had that pretty bad accident. Recovered before I was out of the hospital. I was drinking. I had friends who would come to the hospital, and I now I was doing respiratory therapy daily, three times a day, to get back proper respiration. Um, and uh, I went off to Auburn University. I know there's someone on your schedule from Alabama, which I can't wait to talk to. But I went off to Auburn University in Auburn, Alabama, and uh, didn't really have a a uh, good reason for going except a guy that I used to run around with decided he was going to go there. So that was about the uh, uh, criteria that I considered before attending college. Went went over to, up to Auburn and down to Auburn, actually. It's south of Decatur. And uh, I didn't get much done there. <laughs> uh, but I was there for quite a while, probably three and a half years. I went to some football games. And, uh, and, and we lived... I lived with this gentleman for a while. He's sorry he ever let that happen, but we lived across the road. We lived on Opelika Highway, and we lived in a he lived in a trailer park for a while. Then we moved into this kind of uh, duplex, and so across the road, just about 50 feet, it'd take you. I just took my husband Richard there the other day, and this doggone bar that I used to spend all my time at looks just the same. Run down, graffiti everywhere, filthy bathrooms. The, it's all uh, the unkept outside, broken windows. 
Harry's, if you want to drop by. Harry's Bar. It's like 1313, over like a highway in Auburn. And that's where I was every night. Uh, Harry's did not close. And it was nearly a sure bet that if you were around there in the late 70s, that this gentleman I was uh, keeping time with, Tim, and I would be out there fighting come sun up. Uh, cause that's what we usually were doing. Um, I went to Harry's in my bathrobe, uh, because I didn't have time to get dressed. Um, I went there barely dressed. Um, I, I just, you know, everyone here who's had trouble drinking knows what it's like. But you really lose a sense of responsibility, and I didn't have any. I didn't know how to be a daughter, an employee, a student, a girlfriend, a sister. I didn't know any of it. And in about 1983, I guess it was, or 82, I had a big birthday party. You know how you have your birthday, and it goes on and on for a long time. Mine used to start and then at the end about a week later anyway we had a big shindig down in on opelika highway and about the fifth day of this uh event the police came around about 5 30 a.m i was not properly prepared for them anyway they said well it was a no-knock warrant they came in i i was in the back room I didn't have any clothes on, but I really was working hard to get out the back window. (laughs) The back window was about 25 feet off the ground because of the the houses. The foundation of the house was not flat. And this officer who knew me, because I had a few friends who he'd come around one of them he had to extradite him back to florida but anyway he knew who i was he said uh edith don't jump down there you just go on back in that window and i did and i was um in a little trouble because of everything they found around my house and a couple of the guys over there were felons and uh, it was uh you know just trouble bigger trouble than i'd seen before and uh so I got out on my own recognizance, but they, I had to have a daily communication with them. They wanted me to kind of help them get some other people in trouble, which I was not willing to do. Um, about this time, somebody called Shine up in North Alabama, says, uh, you know, your daughter's really uh, out of control. Well, I had picked up with a pharmacist. I thought that sounded like a good idea. And uh, we were out in a cabin out in the woods with some other people, and I just left my apartment. They'd, it'd been ransacked, and I didn't take anything with me, just left it open, left all my possessions, and uh, and moved out to this cabin. And uh, this is unbelievable to me still, but Shine and Dara, my brother and my daddy, uh, and they hunt and so forth and always had pistols. They both had a gun and they went and got some handcuffs and drove five hours to Auburn, talked to two or three people, found out where I was and came to this cabin and said, uh, either you come with us or we're taking you. <laughs> what do you want to do? So I went with them. They took me to a hospital hoping things would change. Uh, it was a mental hospital. And uh, it was in uh, Nashville, Tennessee. And uh, I stayed up there for a couple of months. I don't know if any of you have. My mother had been up there. Shine was, you know, kind of a benefactor of this place by now. <laughs> but he'd had my mother up there two or three times. He knew the psychiatrist. He kind of thought, I believed that he would uh, see over our recoveries and we'd both come out all squared around, you know. Uh, but anyway... Mother, they were trying to do this shock treatment on, and I didn't want anything to do with that because no one would come out with a memory. 
So I was doing the therapy and taking, they had me on three or four things. It was the idea that you've got an imbalance in your brain, and I was up there uh, uh, taking whatever they told me to take and uh, doing some leather crafts and, you know, (laughs) what else else do you, oh, you make some, we made some moccasins and some, some with, uh, iron where you flatten out the tin i don't know i'm not a very good craft person i know that as i knew after i was there one thing that i did not believe that i was crazy every day you know if you're if you if you don't get arrested when you're not drinking and you don't lose your temper as often maybe drinking's the cause of it hadn't figured that out But I didn't think I belonged with the other folks up there. And uh, it was especially difficult when we would play volleyball because a lot of the folks, this is not offending anybody, I hope, were medicated a lot. And we could never get the volleyball over the... (laughs) Tried, tried, never got a volley going. One guy I remember, Lyle... I'd yell, come on, Lyle, because he was pretty young and he had taken some, uh, I don't know what it was, not Haldol, but whatever he was taking, he still had the, you know, had a little bit of sportsmanship still left. <laughs> so I finally got out of that place and needless to say, it didn't work because I'm an alcoholic and I didn't believe I was one and I wasn't desperate. And I was still in my early 20s, and I thought I had some running to do. And so I, I kept running. Um, the one thing I did do at that point in time, though, was listen to my lawyer, because this gig going down in Auburn was getting more serious because of everything they had found in my apartment. The judge was a uh, older gentleman, and my lawyer said, He's gonna, uh, he ain't going to like this, you know? He just didn't. It's not. It, it, don't consider yourself a guaranteed suspended sentence person. Just don't. And uh, so he said, maybe you ought to go live in a halfway house. And that's how I got to Albert Lee and then Forest City and then Sioux City, Iowa. And in Sioux City, they put me in a halfway house and I stayed there for one year. Because my lawyer told me I absolutely had to do whatever was recommended. I didn't drink. Maybe did a little fraternizing, which was against the rules. But I, as soon as I got out of that place, I quit going to Alcoholics Anonymous meetings. Did not believe that this was a a one day at a time program. Did not believe that I was going to be abstinent for the rest of my life. And Walked in a place, if you've ever been to Sioux City, Iowa, it's called the Dodge Inn. Walked in there, see this guy's been there. A lot of tough guys go there. And and maybe you ride a Harley. Do you? You got a Harley? Okay. A lot of tough folks in there. But I went in there, I had one white Russian, and then I had seven more. Now fortunately I'd picked up I'd picked up with a guy that I was I was kind of a waitress. I was living with him, and he lived two doors down, <laughs> so it was easy to get home. But everything was, everything that they tell you about, about this being a patient disease, it's doing push-ups over in the corner, was true for me. I was driving drunk. I was, I just hesitate to tell you all I did. I got in a bus with a band, uh, a group of band members, left town. Uh, You know, you know how it goes. You wake up, you go out, you read the street sign, and you don't know, never heard of that street before. (laughs) Then you go in, you say, uh, you look at the phone book, and you try to find something that will give you an indication about what town you're in. Everything happened. Just as if I had never stopped, even though I'd been sober for a year. I failed to enhance any kind of a spiritual life. And I was, again, uh, clearly proving that an alcoholic 
needs just what they talk about in the doctor's opinion. You know, after they've succumbed to the desire again, as so many do, and the phenomenon of craving develops, they pass through the well-known stages of a spree emerging remorseful with a firm resolution not to drink again. This is repeated over and over, and unless this person can experience an entire psychic change, there's very little hope of his recovery. And then we know what it is that gives us that um, psychic change. Um, You know, it's something greater than human power. And then he goes on to say here, the only thing that we have found is total abstinence. Um, after being in Sioux City for a while I finally left town I think I'm trying to remember that guy kicked me out of the house I remember everything I had was on the front porch and it wasn't much and I had about $1,200 that I'd saved being a waitress and you know get off at 2 drink till 5 uh, my gentleman who I shared a, a apartment with worked in a restaurant too we had uh parties that have finally got us evicted Um, and in about 1987 I had found a dentist who was kind enough to afford me some uh, uh, you know medication for some real minor problems (laughs) and uh, so I was would take that and drink I loved drinking loved it loved the conviviality of it loved the bar Love walking around and talking to everybody. Uh, whereas when I got into uh, doing, I, I would I would be okay there for a while, but eventually I'd always get back to my isolationism. Um, I, I could go out in public for a while, and eventually I'd end up with duct tape uh, on the windows because I didn't want anybody to know I was home, didn't want you to see there was any light in there, took the phone off the hook. That's kind of where I would usually end up. On this night, I'd been out, gotten some liquid courage, gotten a few pills in me, and once again, I had a bad car accident. I flipped my car, paramedics came, went to the hospital, arrested again, uh... Now, practicing law, I probably shouldn't have taken my blood because I was unconscious, but they did. But anyway, uh, so I was in some trouble because this gig in Alabama, I'd been fortunate enough to get a suspended sentence, but I was still on it. And uh, so I knew that there could be some consequences that were pretty serious. A year ago, a guy shows up in my office And he says, would you please consider representing me? I have this problem legally. He said, and I know you. I don't know the guy's name. You know, you're always thinking, okay, let's see. (laughs) Was I dancing at a bar? What was I doing? And uh, he says, I pulled you out of a car on St. Mary's Avenue at 4 a.m. 13 years ago. He was the paramedic, one of the EMT guys. Needless to tell you tonight that I said, please sit down. I'd be particularly honored to help you legally. He's still my client. Um, Anyway, after that gig, I had a physical problem that was pretty serious, and I was at UNMC, which is the University of Nebraska Medical Hospital. And I was sitting up there, and a doc comes out, and he says, Edith, I have read all of your medical records. Uh, You're an alcoholic. Now, this was not something I had asked him to treat. (laughs) Kind of shocking, in fact. Uh, He said, you're an alcoholic, and this program that we're offering, uh, we need people who are going to be very conducive to being responsible to the therapy that we propose and you ain't it (laughs) so you can leave this guy was so blunt with me he was in his 60s I've never forgotten him I later met his granddaughter he said so you can promise me right now 
that you will not take another drink during the time we're treating you, which could be up to a year, or you can leave. Thanks for coming up. Maybe insurance will cover the evaluation. And uh, I really sat back. For the first time in my life, I thought that he might be telling me the truth and I could hear it. Judges had said this to me, police officers. My mother took me to uh, psychiatrists, preachers, um, you know, you know all the people that you visited. I heard that guy that day, that doc. That was the last day I took a drink. Went to the bar that night, pushed it away, didn't know if I could stay sober, knew that my probation officer on my Nebraska offense was really on me about going to Alcoholics Anonymous. So I go, 48th Street Club, uh, clubhouse, open till 11, 12 at night, meeting, you know, every three hours. I go there, I go there, I go there every night. Don't even know there are any other meetings in Omaha, Nebraska. We have about 592, you know, now in the 90, 2001 year. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm showing up, I'm showing up, I'm listening. Don't say anything, sit in the back, walk out quick as I can. Finally, this woman says to me, hey, Ethel, Stand up and tell us who you are. I said, my name's not Ethel, and I'm just a visitor. <laughs> that gal became my sponsor. Her name was Pamela. She was of the old school where you <laughs> kind of got assigned a sponsor. She made me read the book. We went to meetings every night. I was over at her house almost too much. She had two children, a husband. She put up with me when I was bleeding on the floor. She would avoid me after meetings and talk to every newcomer and then me. I'd, and I thought I was a newcomer. I demanded attention. Didn't she want to know what was wrong with me? She would go to anybody who we hadn't seen before and afford them her hand. When we started working on the steps, she told me the timeline. You will have your fourth step done and then you will call me. And then we will work on your fifth step. And I did those things because I was afraid. I was afraid of drinking. I was afraid of dying. I was fairly certain uh, that even if I died, which wasn't a great loss, somebody else was going to get killed. You know, Jane was a near miss. The accident I had on St. Mary's, I hit a van. The folks were in their home. I had a parked van police officer said, you know, there's a family in there with four kids. They were in that van. Uh, so I figured somebody was going to get killed uh, if I was if I kept drinking. Um, so I was afraid. So I did what she asked of me. And the steps chased my heels. And I think that was because I was desperate. And, you know, a guy from Lincoln, Nebraska named Mark R., says it's more dangerous for you now than it was when you first got here, if you've lost the desperateness. So if we're not working with newcomers, we better be very careful because that's what gives us back maybe the vigilance we need um, because we see where we could be. And uh, Pamela did that all the time. She moved out of town and at a late age, in her late 30s, went to medical school. She's now a doc in Iowa City. And I've been up there to see her say doctor so and so her last name and uh and it's just an honor to have had her in my life i got another sponsor her name is uh karen and karen's been my sponsor since 1989 yeah uh and she's tough too she just is very honest she says things to me like uh when i thought the the guy that i couldn't live without walked out she says to me, do not go by his house. Do not call him. What he's doing is none of your business. Don't ask anyone about him. Uh, and start working with other people. Now, she didn't understand that if I had two or three hours with him, I'd convince him about what a huge mistake he'd made. <laughs> and I mean, it was torture, torture. Plus, he was dating another gal 
And she was coming around to AA. And you know what my sponsor said about her? Put your hand out. You shouldn't sponsor her. Put your hand out and tell her that Alcoholics Anonymous welcomes her. And you know what I wanted to say to her? Hey, baby, you can die in a ditch. I don't give a damn. (laughs) But I had to say, welcome to Alcoholics Anonymous. My first sponsor's husband uh, talked to me about school a few times. And I'd been to five colleges. Uh, and I had, I had graduated from college. It's amazing over all those years. And uh, so I, I enrolled in college, in, uh, in post-college, in a graduate, excuse me, in a graduate school. And uh, I talked to them about uh, my history. I had to apply and, you know, fully disclose what I'd been through, that I uh, was a felon, that I was, uh, you know, my GPA was, (laughs) (laughs) the tape won't show that. It was like XFA, (laughs) never saw her the semester, (laughs) not present. Tried to get a refund on her tuition. <laughs> My father was really disheartened because Auburn had this non-disclosure policy. And unless the student had signed for disclosure, they wouldn't send him the grades. <laughs> and he went down there and uh, gave him some fiery speech. I don't know if he ever saw my grades. Um, but anyway, uh I had to apply. I had to tell them about all this bad history I had. Even in light of all that, they gave me financial aid, and I went to school. I really realized after I'd gotten there what a huge mistake it was because all the other people in this uh, professional school had great study habits, had degrees, had um, uh, you know a history of being responsible, and I didn't have any of that going for me. I had one thing. I had you, and I had a God, and I had this sponsor who said, uh, God will provide. So I kept going. You know, the journey of a million miles starts with the first step. Kept going, kept going. Get to the end of this three years later, and they write me and say, uh, the Bar Examiner's Commission says, Based on your history, we cannot offer you the opportunity to take the bar exam. So then I go to my sponsor, by now it's Karin. I said, y'all set me up on this thing. I spent all this money and now now they're not even going to let me take the doggone test. She said, well, you go talk to your some of your professors who know your history. I did. We went to uh, with letters to the bar commission. They wrote me back the day before the exam started and said we'd be very pleased to have you sit for the bar based on what we have learned about you. What they had learned about me was this, that I participated in Alcoholics Anonymous, that I couldn't guarantee that I would remain sober and clean, but that if my participation in Alcoholics Anonymous continued then I could tell them that the track record of others who had practiced that was good. That I was a GSR in my home group at that time, the 48th Street Club that met on Wednesday nights at 8.30. That I had been a treasurer of a group. That I had volunteered to go to York, which is a woman's penitentiary, and talk about Alcoholics Anonymous that I had attended area meetings at Area 41. We used to meet in Kearney. Now we meet in Grand Island in Nebraska. That I sponsored women and that I was sponsored. And that I tried to have currency with the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. That's what I told them. At the same time, I went to the Board of Pardons and Paroles in Alabama. Now, you can imagine what it was like going back to folks in Alabama who'd read about me in the paper, had sat with my parents when they didn't know where I was for days or when I was hospitalized. And I had to ask those same 
business and community members to write letters for the Board of Pardons and Parole. They all agreed. I take all this down to the board, and this was a state offense, so I was bound by the state of Alabama's laws and statutes. And in 1991, I was granted a pardon from the state of Alabama for my felonious conviction. And if you think the right to vote doesn't count, (laughs) I don't bear any firearms any longer. (laughs) Uh, But the right to be a citizen again, fully and completely, is a great benefit that I've been afforded because of Alcoholics Anonymous. I do not have that pardon up in my office, but I know exactly where it is in my home, and it's very precious to me. Uh, And as time passed, you know, I continued to have the opportunity and still do today to practice this profession. Uh, I have a family in AA that is cementing for me sometimes greater than my blood family. But I want to tell you a a couple of things about my daddy. He doesn't understand what you're about. He doesn't understand what these steps are about. He knows one thing. His daughter's not in jail or dead or in a mental hospital because she's been showing up here on a regular basis. I go to Alcoholics Anonymous meetings three times a week. I have a home group. When I go to Alabama and stay with my father, I go to a group that meets by his home. He was very serious about believing that I was diseased and sick. He bought three life insurance policies on me when I was 17. You might wonder how I know that. When his second wife was dying, My father asked me to help him do some work on the will because she had five children and he wanted to be sure that everyone was going to be situated properly because he loves his stepchildren and he loves my brothers and myself. And he said, look through these and and let's get this organized. And I found three life insurance policies. All of them on my life. All to my brothers as beneficiaries. He said, baby, that's one thing I'm glad I, that's one risk I'm glad I didn't get to bank on. And uh, he knows that I go to these meetings. So I'm at the meeting in Alabama, right by his house, one meeting a week at that time in this small city, Decatur. And I drove his car there. And as I walk out of the meeting, I look on the on the dashboard, I mean on the windshield, and there's all these candies. And this guy that was at the meeting with me said, you know, I saw Shine riding his bike. He, My daddy rides his old, he gets his bikes at the police auctions. And they're all beat, made up and he'll try to fix them. And then he carries this old dog with him in the basket. <laughs> I mean, he's eccentric. But anyway, and I said, I saw Shine leaving. He had that old dog. He's riding his bike. Now, that doesn't mean much to y'all, but I knew what the, what it meant to me, and that was that he'd ridden by there, put those candies on the windshield, just to say, I'm glad you're at that AA, whatever it is. I'm glad you're there again tonight. In 1997, he and I went to Scotland. Peebles is Scottish. And he, uh, we went with my great uncle, who's Real hardliner. He went to the Citadel. Boy, you know, I'm pretty liberal. Boy, he and I just clash about politics, worldview, everything. But he's been very good to me. He planned this great trip. People, Scotland is 20 miles south of Edinburgh. Well, I'd been with my great uncle, all my cousins, all these from five states. We all came down there. We celebrated Thanksgiving. In Peebles. They wrote about us in the small newspaper. The Peebles come to Peebles. Well, actually, what it was was a big drunk fest for the Peebles. <laughs> and I was sober at that time. And they did scotch tasting, and we had a few dinners that ended up in some, uh, some of my cousins having to be escorted out. <laughs> but uh, anyway, after about uh, 
10 days, I was desperate for a meeting. I'd been to one in London, I believe, and I was in uh, Peebles, a very small town, 6,000. And so I get on the, I had gotten off the, uh, uh, you know, the national directory, international directory I had with me. So I knew where the, the main offices were to call. I said, boy, I'd sure appreciate it if somebody could come around and help me get to a meeting. And so the, they give me a call. They say, Miss Peebles, we have a gentleman. Uh, he'll be coming around at 7 p.m. and he'll be whistling down at the front entrance of this. We were at the Peebles Hydro Hotel. And so they were very clandestine. You know, I didn't, I, I go down there and here's Ernie, blue eyed Scotsman, real skinny. And uh, got a little car, you know, everyone, Petro, uh, gasoline's so expensive. Ernie's got a small car, got a, a 385 or 390 a liter, that's what they were paying for gasoline. Ernie's on the dole, you know, the redundancy, um, social security here, he's disabled. His stomach has almost been removed because of his drinking. Ernie says, I came to get you, to take you to the meeting. We go, we drive into, we drive an hour and a half on the other side of Edinburgh. Even though Peebles is close, the roads are pretty dilapidated. We get there, there's all these Scots men and women, and they're drinking tea and scones, and they all tell me their story. Every one of them, because I'm from the States, and as a kindness and a courtesy. And Ernie drives me home. About 1 o'clock a.m. we get back. Of course, Shine and them have been wondering a little bit where I am because I left with somebody. <laughs> I didn't know him and so forth. <laughs> wondering if I'd picked up my old habits. I said, Daddy, uh, Ernie took me all the way in the uh, other side of Edinburgh. Uh, now that doesn't, uh, if that doesn't speak for Alcoholics Anonymous, he gave me the roundabout, I gave him the grapevine. He gave me a card, which I still keep today, and we've corresponded. He says, hey, Lassie, call me before, not after. Now, that guy didn't have the time, the money, the health to come and see after me. But I'm telling you, I've been afforded that courtesy in South Africa, in Canada, in Mexico, in the Dominican Republic, in Fairmont, Minnesota in Decatur, Alabama, and that makes me a world citizen because of you, because I'm at home whenever I come to Alcoholics Anonymous. That is the language of the heart, and you speak it, and I can't tell you anything but this. Karin says to me so often, you can afford to be generous because if life was fair, Edith, you'd be dead. Let me close with one thing. Boy, I got two things. I love this from As Bill Sees It. Cause I didn't, I didn't speak to you a lot about prayer and meditation, but I ended up with a sponsor now, Karen, who's been studying yoga for 15 years. She is contemplative. And many times her response to me will be, take it to prayer. Uh, when I first got here, I believed there was a God, but I didn't believe he could do anything for me. And I will tell you that today in my walk, nearly 14 years later, I'm looking back at step two. I just read, read, came to believe again. Because I have doubted whether God is everything. He's either nothing or he's everything. And I need to remember that he is everything. I need to get back into the realization and the belief that I am one of his children and I need to be listening to what he has to say, which means being quiet. I'm great at activity. You know, my father's very gregarious. I love that. Give me a 100,000 people and I'll talk to them all. But make me sit quietly for 20 minutes. Karin made me get an egg timer. Get an egg timer, turn it around, and you sit there till it clicks. <laughs> when I first came to Alcoholics Anonymous, 
Someone read this to me, and I've always been very fond of it. It's from As Bill Sees It. Since open-mindedness and experimentation are supposed to be the indispensable attributes of our scientific civilization, it seems strange that so many scientists are reluctant to try out personally the hypothesis that God came first and man afterwards. They prefer to believe that man is the chance product of evolution, that God the Creator does not exist. I can only report that I've experimented with both concepts and that in my case, the God concept has proved to be a better basis for living than the man-centered one. Nevertheless, I would be the first to defend your right to think as you will. I simply ask this, in your own life, have you ever really tried to think and act as though there might be a God? Have you experimented? Because I practice law, this reading means a great deal to me. Because I do defend people's right to believe, even if it's not what the majority believes. Alcoholics Anonymous does not require that you believe in God. We only require that you have a desire to stop drinking, as our third tradition says. But if you consider this, you might try an experiment. I'm grateful to be here tonight, and I wish you Godspeed on your journey. Thanks. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.